Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our viewers from around the world. Thanks so much for tuning into the largest ever virtual gathering on happiness with the Happiness Festival. I think this is coming to you in July 2020. I am Dr. Netra Pan. I'm a lecturer in social change and entrepreneurship at Cass Business School in London. My research and teaching focuses on how for-profit firms resolve tensions between commercial and seemingly non-commercial objectives, such as poverty reduction, carbon footprint reduction, and workplace well-being, just to name a few examples. And that's why I'm so happy to be with all of you today for this extremely important panel titled Against All Odds, how our understanding of cognition changes our understanding of meaningful and enjoyable work. During this panel, we'll visit the topics of sources of stress in the workplace, emotionally intelligent responses to stress, how entrepreneurship affects well being, mental disorders associated with entrepreneurship, qualities job seekers, employees, managers could seek in their work. And to help us unpack all these topics. I'm really pleased to say I'm joined by an all-star panel. First, we have Professor Joan Wicklin. Hi, Joan. Hi, Anitra. Professor Joan Wicklin is the Alberg Chair and Professor of Entrepreneurship at the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University, and he holds other positions in uh, Lund University in Sweden, as well as in Australia. His research interests include entrepreneurship and mental health as well as the entry, performance, and exit of entrepreneurial firms. He's a leading expert in entrepreneurship with over 17,000 citations. He's the editor-in-chief for Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice, and he has also uh, edited special issues on well-being and entrepreneurship. I'm also joined by Dr. Eric Nook. Hi, Eric. Hello. Eric is uh, tuning in from Massachusetts, from Boston, if I'm not correct. Uh, I'm actually in New York City right now. Oh, you're in New York City. Okay, so you're a little bit closer to where, where I'm uh, uh, hosting this Zoom call. Um, so Eric Nook completed his undergraduate degree in psychology at Columbia University, where he worked for, uh, he worked with Professor Kevin Oshner. After two years as a lab manager for Professor Zamil Zaki at Stanford University, he, became, he began a clinical psychology PhD at Harvard University, where he worked with Professor Leah Somerville. Eric is currently completing his pre-doctoral internship at Weill Cornell, Cornell excuse me, Medical College in New York City. Okay, that explains why in New York City. Mm -hmm. And he focuses on how language and emotion interact. He uses behavioral and neuroscientific tools to study how labeling our emotions influences how we regulate and represent them. He also uses developmental and translational, translational lenses to study how children and teenagers learn, learn about emotions and how they develop uh, an emotion lexicon related to mental health. So Eric, you'll tell us a little bit more about that. And then last but not least, I'm really pleased to introduce KB McMahon. She's a graduate student in the clinical psychology doctoral program at Duke University. And she's currently completing her clinical internship also at Well Cornell uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital. She's under the mentorship of Dr. Zachary Rosenthal and training in the science and practice of treating interpersonal issues within transdiagnostic clinical populations. So you'll explain a little bit more what you mean about that. And her research uh, focuses on how emotion regulation skills like mindfulness influence empathy, the ability to perceive and understand other people's emotions. KV is also um, experience in treating anxiety, depression, and personality disorders with contemporary cognitive behavioral therapies. And she's also a vinyasa yoga instructor. So she's drawing upon this, um, this practice as well, um, complementing her, her uh, more traditional psycho psychology um, experimental work um, to better understand this topic. So that's enough talking for me for now. Um, I would love to, to kick us off and actually try to understand. So well-being, um, stress, uh, entrepreneurship, I mentioned a lot of words. So maybe we can just take a step back and try and understand how can we actually think about well-being in the workplace? What are the moving parts? Um, why is this important? Um, so maybe we can start with Dr. Eric Nook. Eric? Sure. Um, so I'm happy to give a little bit of background on how psychologists think about stress itself. 
So um, a very popular theory comes from Lazarus and Folkman, the appraisal theory of stress. Um, and it's a very simple idea that people feel stress when they think of a situation as asking more of their resources than what they actually have on hand. And that perspective on their current situation in, uh, causes a stress response, which has psychological components, biological components, motivational components, um, emotional components. Um, and this perspective um, can be very helpful in many different situations. That's why we have it, um, because it gears you up to expend um, resources in order to um, to meet the challenge uh, that that's uh, that you're facing in the situation, but also if the appraisal is that the hey there's no way I can actually cope with the situation that I'm facing, um, then you actually experience distress, um, and that distress can come with all sorts of maladaptive um, reactions, um, feeling defeated by the situation, um, or just overwhelmed um, and kind of at, at your at your wit's end. Um, and so if you think more concretely about what these different situations can be, um, there's a, 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 they fall out really nicely from that definition. So if there's a lot of time pressure and you feel that no matter that what's being asked of you in the situation, you just do not have the temporal resources to really um, accomplish what the situation demands, you're going to feel probably very distressed. Um, and then if things are really uncontrollable, unexpected, um, or aversive, that is also going to induce a stress response. So um, if you, you know, um, if there are challenges that come up or a job description that is not quite what you were expecting it to be, um, or if other people are behaving in ways that are really challenging, um, these are things that are going to add to a lot of stress in, in a work environment. Um, so those are, you know, that's how psychologists tend to think about stress and, and some of the different sources that come to mind. Mm, that's really interesting, Eric, what you mentioned about um, having a baseline of, of resources and then uh, stress being basically um, our response to how we view um, the resources that we have on hand versus what the situation um, calls for. And um, so I, I, I'm recalling some studies that I've seen that shows, as you said, that this can be a stress can be a good thing in, in manageable amounts. So it's essentially a curvy linear relationship where um, too little and you're not motivated at all, too much, you're, you're in distress, as you said. Um, so it's all about managing your resources or developing your resources to find that um, middle ground that I guess some psychologists also call flow um, mm -hmm. when, when basically the, the amount of challenge is, is just right for you. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to, to hear your thoughts, Kibi, um, um, on generally how should we think about uh, stress in the workplace? Yeah, Eric, that was, that was fantastic. It was so <laughs> that was great. Um, yeah, so I was just thinking from the clinical side, um, in, in these contemporary cognitive behavioral therapies, what we say is um, people, people suffer when they don't live in line with their values whatever those are. So we have a diversity of values and your, your values are different than mine and why I work might be different than yours. But if we don't, um, if our work doesn't line up with the things that we find valuable and meaningful in life, it, it could lead to a lot of burnout. It could lead to a lot of stress and anxiety and a lot of questioning of why am I doing this, right? Like the daily grind that doesn't feel meaningful can be super stressful. Um, uh, defeating in many ways. So not clarifying the value of your values and not, um, not engaging in um, uh, work activities that really are in line with that can be super stressful and lead to a lot of burnout. Um, and we'll, we could talk about burnout later, but um, so that's one thing that, that, um, that comes to mind. Um, the second thing that comes to mind is um, I, 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 my work says, you know, I, I'm so focused on how um, relationships and social connection is so important to, to well-being overall. Um, we could definitely see that during the pandemic, right? People feel that very strongly. Um, and so when people don't have a healthy work environment where they feel supported, they don't have um, people around them that um, empathize with them and share their experience or listen to their needs, like it's part of the resources um, that Eric was talking about, um, that could lead to a lot of stress, right? When people feel alone, when people feel like they don't have support um, emotionally or instrumentally 
to do what they need to do, um, that could feel also uh, very stressful and lead to a lot of burnout, anxiety, and depression. So those are the, the two things that pop into mind, not, work not being meaningful and not feeling meaningful and not feeling um, supported or having a good social network at, at work. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for pitching that pitching in, Kibi. Johan, what, what are your comments? Yeah, I have a question, Eric. So it's really interesting. I heard you mentioning uh, appraisal theory there. So uh, we actually conducted a study where we looked at entrepreneurs going through what is probably the most stressful thing you can imagine as an entrepreneur, which is failure. So we, we essentially studied entrepreneur who had gone through bankruptcy. We called them soon after the bankruptcy and, and spoke to them and also had them do some, some survey work. And, and one thing we noticed was just the enormous difference in terms of how they reacted emotionally to uh, to this event, and I mean, some grieved to an extent as if they had lost a loved one. And I think uh, they have the emotional connection. I think you can make that uh, a connection for entrepreneurs. You know, some are so much devoted to their business; it's like being devoted to a a partner. Whereas others kind of just, uh, you know, uh, felt like, well, you know, shit happens. <laughs> it, it's not a big deal, and it's. I think sometimes in entrepreneurship, it's like, I, I, I think you all heard about this uh, failing forward and venture capitalists speak about how entrepreneurs might need one or two failures before they want to invest in them. And I think that's um, that's something that might uh, apply to some entrepreneurs, but it, it's also clear that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, just suffer, to use uh, the term you use there, Kibi, uh, suffer immensely when their businesses fail. So I just want to know if you have any any reflections about that, Eric. That's really interesting um, to think about. And I think it fits nicely with an appraisal approach to think about stress, but also about emotion. Um, and appraisal theorists think that um, the way you're going to feel about a situation, it really doesn't lie in the situation itself. No. It lies in your understanding, interpretation, and the meaning you make out of the situation, which is also a contribution that Aaron Beck made to uh, cognitive behavior therapy um, in thinking that our, our, the, way we, the way we think about something is really key. Um, and I love this idea of um, losing, well, I mean, it's very sad when a, a failure happens and someone feels very upset about it, but it is very interesting to think about it as akin to a death. Um, in this appraisal that you've really lost something. Mm -hmm. And also if you like make, build something from the bottom up, you give it a name, it makes sense that your mind might start to mentalize that that entity as something that actually is living and breathing and growing. And for it to end would be, would be you know, really hard in the same way as losing, as losing a person. You've invested so much in it. You've yeah. imagined a future for it, you know? So you can see why these appraisals, like what the, some of the interpretations you're saying would make sense. Um, so I think even though they're valid though, the, it's really cool to hear that you're doing research on what's actually helpful for people um, in the long run. And so maybe the appraisals we want to help people make when things uh, don't work out is, um, what am I learning from this? What goes on in the future? As Kibi brought up, what's in line with my values? Yeah. As long as I'm working for my values, the outcomes are less important to me. Um, it's really about doing things in the world that are leading me in a, in a direction that um, I, I feel is um, uh, helpful in my life, but also helpful in the world more generally. Kibi, is there yeah, I'm, and it just strikes very personally to me because I'm also um, a business owner. I have opened up a fitness studio right before the pandemic, and so um, I definitely feel the fear fear of failure and um, and um, all of that anxiety that comes with that. And I think that to add on to what Eric was saying, it's um, I think when especially in entrepreneurship, especially in the U.S., I would say, or maybe not just in the U.S., but anywhere, yeah, this is, becomes your child. This becomes your your stamp on the world. And I think what when people appraise a business as a part of their identity, part of their legacy, something about you know the meaning of what that business is, the idea of, of losing it can be even more terrifying versus if it's like, hey, this is just one of many things that I'm contributing to this world or this is just a job, right? Those kind of appraisals um, would lead to probably a le less uh, fear, fear of failure or depression when that business doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you for, for your comments on that. I, I would love to, because I know um, I would like to talk about uh, emotionally intelligent um, 
responses to stress. Um, so I think this is a great segue into it because um, uh, we started off this conversation talking about, you know, fairly um, finite or objective or physical um, ideas that lead to stress, such as uh, time um, or m maybe money um, or may maybe um, physical resources um, that don't match uh, uh, an amount that it, that is called for or that we think is called for. Um, but as um, you've all been discussing so far, there is a very important socially constructed uh, element too um, of what we think others expect, as well as um, what we expect of ourselves, um, And so we're, we're going now talking about um, the idea of um, uh, self-conception. Um, so some of my work looks at social identity, for example, and how um, the way we view ourselves. So um, we rely a lot on Brew and Gardner's work. Um, the way we view ourselves um, in the world actually defines how we choose to act and um, how we measure our actions. Um, so um, I would love to get your, your ideas on how can we be then emotionally intelligent when we think about stress or um, what we're placing value on. Um, is there a way to, to basically understand um, why you're feeling so upset about something um, and and is there something we can do in terms of self-understanding or maybe shifting how we view ourselves in relation to the situation maybe to the failed startup or or, or other um, i would love to open up to to the panelists and, and get your views on that yeah i mean the first thing that comes up i mean uh, also just being mindful and being aware of what you're feeling um, is such an important tool. And this is the first thing that we teach people is um, if, especially if there's stress and anxiety that kind of takes over everything, we teach people to use mindfulness skills to really notice those signs of stress early on before it gets that big, right? It's, um, you know, taking a couple minutes to check in with yourself saying, how am I feeling right now? What does it feel like my body? Oh, I notice that when I'm stressed, I tend to pace around. I'm doing that now. Something must be off. So just noticing throughout the day, how, how are you feeling could really help you tap into um, what's going on because emotions are important signals of things. They're important signals of what's going on in your environment. Are you under threat? Are you losing something? Um, are you angry? Are you being attacked? So they're really important sources of knowledge and we can't just ignore them until it gets really bad. They're like important like alarm signals. Um, so being mindful and aware of what you're feeling. Um, I, I always think about like what's going on in my body, what's going on in my mind. Um, those are all important. Um, signs of, of emotion. Um, so could I take along there a little bit? Because I think it's it's so important what you're just saying, because uh, I just started, uh, I think I'm the first one in entrepreneurship to look at more broad at self-care among entrepreneurs. Exactly the things you're talking about, you know, uh, mindfulness, for example, but also exercise and eating habits and things. And something by which we found is that entrepreneurs that are run a business that's that's up and running they tend to engage more than employees in these things and this is comparable employee groups and we think it's because you have greater control over your time essentially so it's it's easier to run away to the gym let's say uh, during a lunch break than it is for a lot of employees but at the same time we found that those that were in the process of starting a business that you know they were so busy that they actually did a lot less and the interesting thing is we immediately saw that this, this has implications for their state of well-being. So that the entrepreneurs who, who are taking more time, devoting more time to the things you're talking about, Kibi, they were actually the ones that were feeling better, whereas those entrepreneurs who were in the middle of starting the businesses, they registered lower well-being. So it's, it's, it's very well aligned with what you're saying. Super interesting. Exactly. When, when people are starting up a business, you're you're so focused. The whole business is so focused on starting up the business, right? It's so all-consuming. But yeah. I think what you're saying is so important that, um, especially um, companies that make it part of their culture to yeah. to uh, promote self-care and check in. Um, employees that say, "Hey, how are you doing? I noticed you you sound a little bit stressed. Like, do you need to take a break? Do you need to like?" breathe and do you want me to you know so having a, a workplace culture that really promotes the self-care and checking in with their emotions would it would do wonder so i agree with you do you have examples do you know what like uh who's the best in class in terms of uh, those kinds of businesses that really focus and emphasize on these things do you know anything offhand 
Um, I I'm don't. Just... I know that my own business tends to do that. We tend to we tend to really support each other. And when someone says I am feeling a little burnt out, say okay, let's talk about this and promote open um, open communication and support and mutual support on that. Um, but I do know that a lot of business. Oh, you know, one one that actually comes to mind is um, Lululemon. Okay. which I was really surprised about, but Lululemon actually has a really good workplace culture where they constantly support that. They even give small funds to the employees to um, do self-care activities. So, you know, they have a budget, a daily budget to go to the gym, to do mindfulness classes. Um, and they check in with each other. They have meetings where they start with mindfulness. So I really, yeah, I think Lululemon, Lululemon is doing a really good job with that. I also know that some of these, you know, business incubators and and those kinds of uh, of organizations are, are are starting to do this. For example, you know, organizing um, yoga classes and and having mindfulness sessions and so forth. And it's fun. I met a guy who runs. Uh, he doesn't run an accelerator. He runs a decelerator. And the reason is that he he gone through a burnout himself. So he he knows how stressful it can be. And he. He kind of wishes people to uh, slow down and and be more inward looking, and uh, because there's so much focus, you know, on working around the clock, as you said, and just you know uh, stretching yourself. That he started this decelerator. I forgot his name now, but I think it's a pretty cool idea. <laughs> um, I have a few thoughts on this. Um, one thought that I have is um, all of these great self-care activities um, that you all are talking about are really just a set of skills that anyone can learn and that um, institutions can educate people on and also that leaders can set as norms within companies, which is what mm. you're describing. Mm -hmm. And I've done some research on how social norms propagate um, through communities. Um, and we've actually found that um, in our case, we're showing how preferences for different foods, but it really could be any different type of stimulus. Um, if uh, individuals find out that their peers all really like a certain food, not only do they endorse liking that food more, but also their ventromedial prefrontal cortex is more active in response to those foods. Um, and this region is implicated as, as um, really um, being involved in value-based decision-making. Wow. So we have this internal signature of, of valuation of, of, uh, is actually increased by, by social norms. So you can do a lot of power as a leader by doing the kinds of things that you're talking about, not only psychologically, but also neuroscientifically, which is, which is really wow. interesting. Um, and then I have another thought on uh, this idea of decelerating. Um, it reminds me of Bina Venkataraman's book, The Optimist's Telescope. Um, her uh, kind of contribution in the book is a real critique of uh, one aspect of modern culture, which is so focused on today, the next quarter, the next, like, is this, are, what are we doing right now? Are we doing everything for right now? Are you doing everything for right now? And mm -hmm. that is really out of line with how historically a lot of human society has moved and thought, and also out of line with, you know, values and even outputs, you know, like human lives getting burned out. And is this really the culture we wanna produce? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I know that there are reasons why people think this way. I'm not saying it's, it's silly to have this ingrained in you, but she really talks about, hey, let's take a look at what we want to leave on this earth years or generations from now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that perspective, we have a completely different way of, of operating. Um, so it's cool to hear about a decelerator. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you everyone for all your thoughts here. I think this is, we're now entering, you know, from a more theoretical standpoint of, you know, what is stress in the workplace to actually some really important uh, outcomes that can be devastating. So um, I want to throw in a few uh, current event examples too. In Japan, um, it's so common for employees to work themselves yeah. to death that there is a word for it uh, called karoshi. And uh, there's a social norm that, uh, that is very much in line with duty uh, and an obligation that, um, that, lead, that makes it somehow socially acceptable, although it's becoming less, um, less so, to actually uh, dedicate your life even literally to, to this. Um, and we, we've seen the same thing, you know, it's not only a, a Japanese phenomenon, we've seen it also in the financial industry um where interns uh under high pressure um 
also uh, suffer heart failure, um, uh, sometimes fatally. And uh, this led uh, Goldman Sachs in 2015 to restrict the intern workday to 17 hours. So this essentially means go home before midnight and don't come back before 7 a.m. So if you can think about you know, what was actually happening, happening, people would go home, take a shower, leave the car running if they ordered an Uber or a taxi, and then get back into their car. So, so we have um, definitely skills that we can do, thankfully. Thank you, Eric, for bringing that up. Um, but it's also the role of, of um, founders and of um, policymakers and of institution uh, leaders to actually uh, set norms and, and make clear boundaries um, on that point. So other things you know, we, we could do is, is be explicit about the norms of your organization. Um, about what what you're here for, why you're here, and and what actually matters. Is it really the bottom line at the end of the day, or 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 something else? Um, you can also uh, use um, um, firm related tools. You know, maybe you have more variable, uh, sorry, less variable um, rewards, and more non variable rewards to to reduce. Um, uh, that source of stress there. So, so there's a conceptual work that can be done by leaders as well as, you know, some strategies, uh, uh, some basic strategies re regarding re remuneration before you even get to the coconut water and the yoga and the massage classes that we see <laughs> very often in Silicon Valley. So speaking of this toxic work culture that, that, that exists, I, I want to turn over to the panelists and ask, ask uh, based on your research or uh, your, your clinical work, um, what are some mental disorders or, or, or common, um, uh, sort, common types of distress um, that you've seen? And, and maybe I can uh, start with Johan, um, since you're an expert here in entrepreneurship. You mean in entrepreneurship? Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that let me roll back a little and say, I, I think that, I mean, the narrative we've seen in entrepreneurship, and if you just look at in popular press, but also in uh, research, has been very much an economic one. So it's been very much focused on, you know, making a profit and who makes a greater profit is about getting venture capital funding, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that uh, that, that that's fine in a way, but it, it's become too dominating. I think it's important to also ask the questions of, you know, who actually enters into entrepreneurship and why do people become attracted to entrepreneurship? And if we if we ask those questions seriously, I think we we get to observe other things. And one of the things is is, is what you what you're bringing up now in terms of of mental disorders because. We have noticed that if we ask a question who is attracted to entrepreneurship, we find that essentially people that are along any dimension different from the norm tend to be attracted to entrepreneurship. And we can take the example of, of like recent immigrants. We can take the example of people with a disability. And uh, it seems that, uh, you know, people with certain um, um, uh, like uh, mental differences are also attracted to entrepreneurship. And, and the ones that are best known are probably people with uh, dyslexia and people with ADHD. Those are two specific conditions. And it also seems that people with these two conditions can potentially do uh, very well in entrepreneurship. And the reason why, I mean, um, is largely that first of all, you know, if you are different and you go to a job interview, it's not very likely you're going to get a job because it's something which people notice. And most organizations just want to hire somebody who's just like everybody else. But the beauty of entrepreneurship is a little bit like the beauty of being an academic. You can shape your work to be whatever you want it to be. And then if you are different, uh, you know, it's uh, you can actually overcome your 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 weaknesses and shortcomings and uh, leverage your strengths. I can just give an example. I, I um, I've interviewed a person who's blind and runs a cafe, and I mean he immediately said, you know, if if I go if I went and applied for a job at a cafe and I'm I can't see, I mean I'm never going to get a job, but I can I can run my own cafe because I've hired people who can do the things I can't, and I'm very good myself with certain things. So that's a good example. And that also applies to people that are mentally different. 
And like I said, if you have dyslexia or ADHD, it seems that you have certain strengths uh, which you can leverage in mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. I yeah, can, so Kibi, did you I like that? But I just wanted to say, Kibi, did you like that shout out that you're a, you're an outlier there as a business owner? That's true. Um, I think the the ADHD, um, what uh, why people with ADHD would be attracted to entrepreneurship makes total sense, especially the the amount of stimulation and the amount of um, lots of moving parts and the excitement that comes with entrepreneurship. It's up and down. You're constantly looking for different things. So. Um, definitely, I can understand that. I, I do. I do see that there would be a flip side to that, where people with ADHD tend to um, feel very anxious a lot of the time. If because entrepreneurship is exciting, but also takes a lot of long dedication, organization, um, completing things, um, and so people with ADHD could be really good at starting businesses and stuff but to follow through and make sure that it's well run um that could cause a lot of anxiety because that's not their uh, skills uh, skill set so yeah so i could see that there's a they could hire someone with the organization skills to do that <laughs> exactly i mean the, the one i think i've been i mean i've spoken to probably 100 entrepreneurs who 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 identify with or have a formal adhd diagnosis and i, I don't think i've met a single one who does their own books you know, it's, it's typically, the, you know, the bookkeeping, the, the, the attention to detail as you're talking about, that's where one of their big weaknesses, and it creates a lot of, of anxiety and stress. Just So, I mean, there are some people who just don't uh, file their books. I mean, and then, of course, IRS comes <laughs> running after them sooner or later. But uh, the most common is, I mean, if you're a, a new startup and, and you can't afford hiring somebody, uh, it's typically the spouse or, you know, the romantic partner who... Who, who, who does the books because it's um, it's nothing that people with ADHD enjoy doing. We also find that it's actually, like you say, the moving parts and those, but also this, you know, the, the hyperactivity part that you just have an enormous work capacity. A lot of people emphasize it, that it's very helpful as well, that they can, like Netra, you mentioned the people there at, uh, I think you said Goldman Sachs, putting in mm -hmm. 17 hours per day. I mean, there's a lot of entrepreneurs of, with ADHD who are happy to put in those hours and, and they feel that they can work more more hours and more effectively than than, than other people. And also the, the impulsivity uh, that they're, they're not afraid. You know, they're not afraid of trying new things. They're not afraid of, of acting. So it's a little bit like, like being a firefighter. I, I often say that if, if my her house starts burning and the firefighter comes, I will be very happy if that person has ADHD because I know they will act, act very, they'll be very resolute and they will be very quick in acting. And that's also something, something which can be, uh, be valuable in entrepreneurship. Yeah, this I think this is a, an excellent discussion and to loop it back actually to the um, definition of stress that Eric mentioned again at the beginning of the panel, because I think it, it's such a helpful metaphor. If we think about um, a, a set of resources, again, um, not being enough or uh, uh, meeting a certain threshold for a certain situation, um, all of a sudden with this discussion about mental disorders and individual differences more broadly, um, we actually see there is a um, interpretation involved in, in understanding our resources versus seeing it as a disadvantage. So um, we, we see, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Joanne, uh, about people with disabilities kind of being pulled into the opportunities of entrepreneurship. Sometimes it's a necessity entrepreneurship. It's, it's a, not an exciting source of growing income, but it's just a, a job. Um, but other times, um, the, the entrepreneur is actually forced into this role because they don't fit the typical characteristic yeah. um, that others are looking for, which may actually turn out to be uh, a good thing for them. Um, so this is a really interesting qu uh, question, I think, to unpack, especially at this time as we try to think about um, work-life balance, since a lot of people are working from home with uh, the, the pandemic um, and what that means for uh, parents of young children um, or single parents or single mothers, um, yeah. as well as uh, what it means for perhaps people of color who have uh, who face other types of systemic discrimination um, when applying for jobs. And what does that mean for them? Can they then actually create their own opportunity? Maybe that is their main choice uh, that's th that is available to them. So this is actually really interesting in terms of how do we interpret our own resources that we have vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the situation 
Well, we are running a little bit out of time, so I would love to turn to each panelist. If there's something that I should have asked you that uh, I didn't, uh, please do feel free to, to, to share. Um, you have a wealth of, of um, experience and, and wisdom here that um, I would be remiss to, to overlook. Um, so please um, do share that. And um, maybe if you have any closing remarks then about um, what uh, viewers should do if they themselves are looking for a job or are in a current job that's 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 uh, providing stress or if, if someone is actually in a position of power, maybe their, their manager or founder, um, kind of what would you recommend to them in terms of thinking about um, well-being and uh, the entire human um, as we uh, are also active members of this economic system? Um, I can jump in, my closing remarks. So what a great set of prompts. So I have, I have, <laughs> I'm all over. Uh, Choose whichever one you like. <laughs> I love them. So, um, in thinking about um, mental health, not so we talked a lot about how um, certain kinds of psychological processes um, that m people might consider um, not normal or just dis dis uh, a di uh, disorder. Sorry, uh, like ADHD can actually be helpful. But I also want to talk about the other side. So. Um, you know, anxiety and feelings of, of sadness or burnout um, are, as Kibi said, normal responses to things that are going on in the environment, but they can become too much and can become impairing. And this is really normal. And we just got to talk about it because um, clinical scientists estimate that 50% of people will have a diagnosable mental illness at some point in their life, one in two. And so if you are having this experiences, you have not failed. There's nothing wrong with you. That This is a a part of being a human being. And there's a whole profession of people who have dedicated their lives to helping um, people learn how to feel better, sleep better, remember more, have better relationships. And so just find a therapist and chat with them. Um, and if you notice that other people in your community are, are impaired by their level of um, anxiety or depression or other experiences that they're having, create a culture of encouraging them to reach out and go to help mm -hmm. just as you would if somebody hurt their arm, like encourage them uh, to seek care. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I also wanted to talk about um, that aspect of mental health in the workplace. Um, my other thoughts were um, thinking about launching from the point of what do you do if you notice your well-being is low, your stress is high. Um, two ideas from, from my research are um, one, the importance of taking a distanced perspective on a situation. So I've done some research showing that looking at a, a negative situation by kind of seeing it from a, a more distant perspective or even just changing your language as simply as not using your uh, the word I, but using your own name when, when writing about something that's upsetting you can reduce your um, negative uh, distress. And research by Ethan Cross suggests that that also increases your ability to um, perform in high stress situations. So um, see things from what, what, how is this going to play out a long time from now? Or if something really upset you, make sure you see it as in the past, it's not happening right now. So um, distancing is one idea. And then the, the final idea I'll leave you with um, is this concept of emotion differentiation or emotion granularity. So we know that um, people vary in how specifically they can really identify what they're feeling. Some people just feel bad a lot and some people feel frustration but then annoyed and then you know they're very specific and granular in their emotions and these individuals cope um, are more resilient to stressful experiences um, and have higher mental health indices overall so learning how to be very specific these skills that could be um, shared with us noticing when you're feeling something trying to figure out what that feeling is in particular and the best way to handle it are skills that we can learn and mindfulness has actually been shown to be very helpful with it um, so those are some of my concluding remarks. Thank you so much, Eric. I, I do want to just highlight that 50% will, will, uh, are expected to be diagnosed with some sort of mental disorder, which actually gets to the title of the, the panel, Against All Odds, and how our understanding of cognition can change our understanding of meaningful and enjoyable work. So thank you for, for sharing that and for um, uh, pushing towards a destigmatization of these these um, these uh, diagnoses because if your if your arm was broken I mean you just go and get it looked at right so this is a big shout out if forever anyone who's watching um, if you feel pulled to 
to see a therapist. There are a lot of organizations out there that um, um, that sponsor uh, um, their uh, therapy for for people with lower uh, social economic income. I mean, so so we can um, link up to a few resources there, but but do reach out to the, your community, um, even if it seems like something that is completely out there. So thank you so much for sharing that and for also sharing the skill of maybe how to um, just simple tricks that you can do to remove yourself uh, conceptually from this stressful situation. So using the third person, talking about yourself in the third person and seeing, witnessing kind of what you're going through to kind of um, strengthen that emotional intelligence and actually be able to discern what is actually happening and that it's not uh, the three P's, it's not personal, it's not uh, permanent and it's not um, pervasive. Um, so to actually uh, take a step back from that. Um, I would love to hear uh, KB Johan, uh, what are your concluding remarks? What would you like to leave our viewers with? Sure, um, I think the one, um, one mental mental disorder, I don't think it's necessarily a mental disorder, but a condition that people um, suffer from at the workplace often is um, burnout. So burnout is a growing problem in the workplace, entrepreneurship and, um, and healthcare and all these different, um, different spheres. In parenting as well, people who are parents, that's a workplace too. Um, so burnout, uh, for, for people who don't know a lot about it, burnout is a feeling of depression. So feeling like you don't care anymore, you're sad, you don't even, um, you're not excited about what you're doing. So this kind of feeling of depression plus this feeling that you're not effective. So it also affects the way you feel about yourself and your ability to get things done. So if you feel depressed plus this um, doubt that you can really keep going or doubt in yourself or um, changes in the way you see your skill set and strengths, that that's a, um, a lot of signs of burnout. That's like on the on the end of like when you're so stressed for so long and don't have the resources and support, people tend to um, suffer from burnout. So just to be aware of that. Um, and I, I'll add to Eric's list of tips and, uh, and skills. Um, for one thing, when I was talking about um, making sure that you are living in line with your values, taking a moment to reflect on what your values are or remind yourself. Um, little tricks that I ask my patients is, let's say it's your 80th birthday and everyone's celebrating and giving speeches, um, celebrating your life. What do you want them to say? What, what are the kind of things that they would celebrate about your long and fruitful life? Um, so that's a little like thought experiment to, to do, or even just think about what is the, what is a meaningful moment? What is a, in the past, like 24 hours or week that you felt like, Oh, that was, that's what life is all about. Um, that was really worth it. Even if it was so hard. So focusing on, why that was so meaningful to you. So taking a moment to reflect on your values is really important. And um, different tricks to, um, to uh, skills to do during the day to check in with yourself um, and how you're feeling emotionally and your sources of stress. I just promote saying, take one minute, like time it on your phone, one minute mm -hmm. every few hours to take a deep breath, notice how you're feeling in your body, notice, notice what's going on in your mind. And you can ask yourself certain questions. You could say, how am I doing right now? How stressed am I on a scale of zero to 10? <laughs> and so even if you do that once a day, a couple times a day, taking one minute out of your day to check in with yourself would be super helpful to prevent that burnout um, uh, and the buildup of stress uh, in the future. Thanks so much, KB, for, for kind of demystifying, you know, what we mean by mindfulness. You talked earlier in the panel about, um, you know, checking in physically, how does the body feel? And, um, um, what mindfulness means, because sometimes, you know, we associate it with, okay, it's like some, some sort of hippie thing, what on earth does it mean? So these are actually really concrete steps, you know, just how do I feel from one to 10 in terms of stress? And, and um, I think that's really meaningful. I also love what you, you raise in terms of uh, values and trying to understand your values, um, because if we think about our lives or the work that we engage in, there's always going to be more enjoyable and less enjoyable parts. So it's really important to understand, you know, why am I doing the 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 least and the less enjoyable part, and uh, create that meaning for ourselves um, by understanding our own values. So thanks so much for for adding that, Johan. What are your reactions? Yeah. So uh, first, I want to comment on what Eric said about referring to yourself in th as a third person. I always thought that was a, a sign of inflated ego. <laughs> I just uh, I just learned that it could be a sign of that you care about your own well-being. So that's uh, that's a good thing to know. Uh, 
Yeah, so I think it's important to, to, to think about the fact that, I mean, well-being isn't just the absence of ill-being, that well-being is related to to happiness and, and feeling re- relationships with other people and so forth. And I think that's that's where you started this session. I think it's important to also keep that in mind as we as we wrap it up. Mm. And I think that if we look at entrepreneurship, which is, which is my area of research, we can see that uh, a lot of people, um, they enter into entrepreneurship in order to self-actualize, in order to become what they think they're supposed to be. And we can see that when, when they do research about the overall well-being of entrepreneurs versus people who have empl- em- or employees, um, entrepreneurs exhibit on average a little bit higher well-being. And it's largely for this reason that they feel that they're doing something that's deeply meaningful to them. They were actually able to self-actualize to a greater extent than the uh, employees. On the other hand, we see there's a wide distribution. So there's a lot of mm. entrepreneurs who feel good about themselves, but there's also, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs who feel really bad about where they are. And uh, I can just echo what Kim was talking about before in terms of, of reflecting about uh, over who you are and where you are, uh, where you are, and in, in, in investing in self care activities because we've we've seen that those really pay off for entrepreneurs. Thanks a lot, John. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think that's a really um, that's a really great uh, set of reactions and um, um, very interesting food for thought as we think about uh, what different career outcomes um, may represent to us. So, in I, I assume you're referring to uh, opportunity driven entrepreneurship. So maybe more growth oriented entrepreneurship in terms of self actualization well, or the, the studies we've seen is just. Uh, they run these panels across, you know, uh, most countries in the world, and they're just looking at anybody who says I'm I'm working for myself versus those who say I work for somebody else. That's so they don't care about for the reasons as to why people start. On average, uh, people who work for themselves score higher on any, you know, you can take subjective well-being, you can take more of the eudaimonic approach to well-being. We see that those that work for themselves score higher than those who work for somebody else. And the explanation is largely self-actualization uh, aspect or whatever you want to call it. This is, uh, you do the things that you enjoy. Uh, you reap the fruits of your own, own work and so forth. Hmm. But I mean, part of, the, part of the reason we have this wider distribution, I think, is because some are, are drawn to entrepreneurship, whereas others are more pushed into it. That's, as you can hmm. see among you know, recent immigrants, for example, that because of lack of knowledge of language, maybe due to racism and whatnot, they don't have many other options to start their own businesses. I could imagine they score uh, towards the lower end, but mm-hmm. we have the whole spectrum there. Yeah, that's definitely really interesting food for thought of um, what what could a, a self-designed uh, um, job uh, offer us uh, in terms of self-actualization. Um, versus uh, what are the barriers uh, preventing others from actually getting that self-actualization either from the same job uh, or, or from a different one. Um, so yeah, very, very thought provoking. Um, I, I definitely can say that um, my own understanding of cognition has changed <laughs> has changed over this panel. A lot of great, great reminders, uh, great tips of um, how to uh, Think about stress conceptually, um, how to think about stress perhaps in, in the moment and uh, which types of practices we can rely on, uh, we can rely on to, to mitigate that. And perhaps also uh, to Johan's point, how we might shift our focus towards a, a more long-term view of um, my job in the future or what I would like to do in the future. Um, also tying in uh, Kibby's point of, you know, what are my values and, and what does this mean for, for the long run? Um, and, uh, you know, removing yourself from maybe that stressful uh, situation of now and actually thinking about yourself as someone who develops and who evolves and, 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 and perhaps uh, feels better as well um, over, the long, over the long term. So I want to thank uh, everyone for joining in, for, for viewing. I want to thank our panelists again. Thank you, Johan. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Kibi. And um, we'll, uh, we'll have our bios and um, where you can reach us um, on the website, the Happiness Festival, happiness-festival.org. Um, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in and, and be safe wherever you are.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>